bear with me if I uh, mess up the, the technology a little bit. Um, I'm told by Francis that I have control uh, from here in terms of slides and things. Uh, so let's see if that works. Okay. Uh, how does this press? Okay. There we go. Great. Excellent. Right, there we go. Uh, yes, so that's just the title page. We don't need to dwell on that for very long. Um, if we go on to the next one, perfect. Um, this is just a very brief introduction. Um, obviously, being Marine and Coastal Manager, I'm going to talk about uh, Jersey's marine waters. But um, what I hope to be able to do is to explain to you how all the, the little bits of data, the sort of stuff that Francis was talking about yesterday, um, can be merged with some of the other data sets and things that are around to, to start to create um, more sort of wider models that can be used um, in terms of our sort of uh, future management and planning of marine um, things. So just a few basics. Uh, Jersey has territorial seas around about 2,500 uh, square kilometres, um, around 31 kilometers, uh, square kilometres of which is intertidal. Um, and that includes uh, a vast range of uh, topographic features and habitats and things uh, like the offshore reefs, the Ekrahoes and Minkies and places like that. Um, and over the past few years, in a, a fairly sort of low-key background way, um, uh, my team, the uh, Marine Resources team here, uh, have been uh, gathering data for a marine spatial planning project. Um, and I'll give you a a very very brief overview of what that is, but essentially marine spatial planning, it's not a, a term that's uh, been invented locally. They, there have been programs running all over the world for several years. And the idea is that um, you, you gather uh, all the information you can, as has been done on land already, and start to use it to work out uh, which bits of sea uh, are being used for what purpose and how they should be used uh, in the future. Um, and uh, as I say, Jersey's been doing that for a while. Uh, I think Guernsey has a, a project that's underway, um, and the UK and France and other EU countries uh, have been doing it uh, uh, for some considerable time. In fact, uh, there's a directive that compels them to do it. Do you think there's a problem? You sound a bit crackly, Francis. Don't know if there's a problem with your microphone. Sorry, about Francis, Paul. No, right, Francis, exactly. it's good to see. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Is that, better? Is that any better? So okay. It sounds a bit crackly. It was fine right. yesterday, which is a bit odd. Okay. Uh, if I, I'm just trying to think, um, because obviously I'll, I'll just have to keep talking for a bit and then you can tell me if it gets any better. Is that, oh, I've disappeared. Is that any better? We've disconnected the sort of screen we've got here. You good? It still sounds a bit crackly, I'm afraid. Right, I'm trying to think how we get around that. Um, uh, that's, I mean, that's uh, what Francis is saying. It could be the Wi-Fi here. Um, I, I'll just carry on, Paul. It's not too bad. Okay. Um, hang on, hang on two seconds. We have an emergency. We have an emergency mic. So you might just have to run your microphone here. Okay, hang on. Switch it to Much better. That sounds perfect. Well done. Okay, yeah. fantastic. There we go. How's that? <laughs> uh, I always find it ironic because I'm reasonably good with computers, but awful with technology. So um, there you go. Uh, things don't always run together. Right, where was I? Uh, need to get back to the main screen now. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to, because now slightly behind, I won't dwell too much on the, the marine spatial planning side of things. Um, the objectives are really to create uh, a, a sort of an evidence-based framework, which in this day and age is on uh, GIS software, so um, sort of computer uh, mapping software. Um, and the idea is to gather all the information that you possibly can, put it in one place, and then from that, you can start to see how different bits of the ocean are being used and uh, work out where there are conflicts and also uh, what the possible solutions for that are. As I say, it's been done uh, on land for, for many years, as, as we in the Channel Islands know very well with our sort of island plans and uh, uh, that approach. 
Um, in Jersey, we, we took a two-stage approach um, because it's not actually a, a formal government project at the moment. And the, the, the first phase, which is what we're coming to the end to at the moment, was to develop the model. So gather all the data and synthesize it together and put it into a GIS format that can be used. And then from that, uh, the idea would be, uh, assuming people um, agree with it, is to re review and then uh, consult and then actually make a plan. Um, here we go. This, these are the sort of areas that we've been gathering information on. And again, I'm not going to develop, uh, dwell on them too, too long. Um, and I can send a copy of the presentation to uh, anyone that wants afterwards or obviously it'll be on YouTube. Um, so these are the areas. Uh, it, it's very wide ranging. So it's everything from archaeology, geology. We want to know about all the outfalls, access points, tourism use, obviously the natural environment in terms of habitats um, on native species, as well as the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, environmental quality side of things, water quality and, and sort of heavy metals, things like that. Um, the idea being to draw it all together. Um, and from this, uh, if I can go on to the next slide, come on. Nope. Right, why am I not getting the next slide on this? There we are, fantastic. Um, from this, uh, we obviously started gathering an awful lot of the environmental information in the background, um, and we've taken it from as many different sources as we can find. Some of those are very old. So in the corner there, you've got uh, what are uh, depth soundings from old Admiralty charts done in the 1860s, which are obviously still largely relevant today. Um, and then there was an awful lot of work uh, done within this region in the 1970s uh, and 80s on the, the French side. Um, there was a lot of uh, regional studies done in terms of habitats and uh, sediment quality and things like that. And then we've got far more recent information um, that have come from various sources, various sort of surveys that have been done, and very recent stuff that comes from satellite data. So on the, on the right-hand side there, on the top, you've got uh, oceanic productivity, as it was on the 6th of August this year. And for the same uh, day, you've also got the sea temperatures. Um, and all that data uh, are downloadable and um, capable of being integrated into the model. Now, we wondered what on earth to do with all of this, because obviously they, not all of it um, covers all the areas. So we, we've got good information for certain areas and then it'll drop off in others. But actually, when you start to merge these data sets, uh, you do get good coverage. Um, so some of the 1970s work focused on the south of the area. Some of the 1980s work was more concentrated on the north and there's overlap in the middle. And when you start to Paul, I don't know if you can hear me, but your computer's frozen. No, our first big tech problem. <laughs> we did so well yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's bound to happen. Is there anybody online in the office with Paul? Do we know? Just the offices. Um, they're in the same office. I'll just see if there's anybody else in that building. I think Sam Blampier would have been able to notice. Sound on there you are. Okay, really sorry, everybody. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we interpolated the data, filling in the gaps, and then um, resampled everything onto a grid that we put across the whole of our territorial waters, in fact, actually the whole of the, the gulf that we're in, um, which divides it up into 250 by 250 meters squares. And what that looks like, hopefully, if it's going to let me change slides. Come on, you can do it. Francis, we're not changing slides here. 
Uh, I think you might have lost control because you dropped out. Emily's no, just... Right. Sorry. Bear with us. Sorry. <laughs> Do you know, I'm really glad I'm not doing this with a hangover, which is what you'd normally do at uh, <laughs> the first talk on a, on a Tuesday morning, otherwise, on the second day rather, otherwise it'll be a, a real disaster. Uh, right, am I there yet? Yeah, you should have control now. Thanks. Right. Oh, no, you've gone right back to the, the screen. Come on. Okay, so there you go. Um, Right, okay, got it. That gone one too far. Uh, that's what uh, the 250 by 250 metre uh, grid system actually looks like. So there it is covering the whole of the Jersey's waters on the, the left hand side. And you can see when you look in detail, um, it, it, it's very detailed. And for each of these little squares, um, well, we got, I should say, we, we put together around about 50 data sets to incorporate in this, and from that, created 15 individual layers that look at individual parameters, such as tides, such as the sediment, so the substrate, um, the depth, temperature, uh, as well as things like slope, chemistry, productivity, and other sorts of things like that. Um, most of these layers uh, cover the whole of the Normano Breton Gulf. Um, and that's a total of around 230,000 individual little squares, and uh, all of them can be queried either via the GIS or via database. So you can actually, uh, in some respects, ask this model questions. Um, and eventually, uh, the thought is that you'll be able to use a model like this uh, for sort of management and planning purposes. So here's some of the outputs we've got, just to give you an idea as to what the uh, the sort of things we look like. I mean, although these are graphical, uh, actually it's the information in the layers that's important rather than the fact that they can look pretty. Uh, and so and it, these are just uh, outputs from individual layers. So you've got the bathymetry on the, the, the left-hand side there. So in other words, depth, um, and then things like slope. So in other words, the, the, the degree of steepness of the seabed, um, even things like distance from shore, which we use to, to help calculate the exposure of individual areas of coast. And then down the bottom, um, just to be really uh, sort of slightly over the top, we've sort of got 3D views and things that we're starting to generate as well from some of these data. Um, it's, I suppose the next question is, well, well, what do you need all this for? And the first thing is that you can produce some quite nice statistics from it. Um, and I just mucked around on here and worked out that uh, on the top of a spring tide uh, within Jersey's water, there's roughly 88.2 trillion uh, litres of water around there. Um, the average tidal movement, I think, moves around about 20 trillion more uh, waters. Uh, five minutes left, right, okay, I'm going to push on in that case. And average depths on that kind of stuff. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, more importantly, we are using it to uh, do habitat modelling around there. So these are the benthic habitats and things that we've got. Um, this is uh, following the JNCC thing, because when you've got the sort of information that was used to create uh, those of you that are familiar with the JNCC habitat classification scheme, the marine one, um, it's uh, created very systematically uh, using a series of, series of criteria. Now, we've got those criteria as layers, and so we were able to uh, query this model in effect and say, well, given that we uh, can work out the exposure for a particular area, its depth, um, its sediment type, and various other sorts of things, what do you think model uh, the habitats should be there and it seems to work very well after much uh, playing around on levels three for rock and levels five for sediment within the JNCC classification scheme and uh, based on that we uh, then manually reviewed the entire uh, sort of map against uh, other sort of evidence and things that we've got um, and it's been independently reviewed as well so we've now got a really nice habitat map uh, that covers the gulf in general which is on the left hand side there but uh, truthfully, we've concentrated more specifically on Jersey Wharton. So we're, we're quite happy um, with that as a, a sort of model going forward. Um, and again, from this, you start to derive other information. So uh, when you know the habitats that are down there and you can start to, to play around with their ecosystem service uh, functions and, and uh, processes and things, uh, you can start to work out what the key habitats are. And there's a, a, an early attempt on the left hand side these are the the, the habitats as far as we're concerned uh, based on the, the the ecosystem service and all sorts of things those are the ones that are valuable and then you can do slightly more 
Ponzi things like calculate primary productivity using the satellite data and things like that on there. Now, I suppose you sort of say, well, well what's the point in, in all of this? Um, we think that when you start feeding other information into these models, you can start to, to get them uh, to produce uh, far more interesting things and things that are relevant and slightly more um, unique. And this is our first attempt at blue carbon uh, modeling for the area. I'm sure you're familiar with blue carbon, but essentially it's the, uh, as you would do on land, it's, it's trying to work out where your carbon is produced, where it uh, goes to and where it is stored. Um, and this is our first attempt by feeding biomass, sediment accumulation data and various sort of sediment properties and water depth and various other bits and pieces into it, um, actually from three different sources. And they all came out very similar, funnily enough. Uh, two minutes left, right, OK. Um, and so here's our thing. So on the left hand side there, you've got our uh, carbon stock. So in other words, that's where all the carbon is at the moment in living animals, in plants and things. I, I should say this is just for sediment. We, we haven't taken uh, primary productivity, so plankton and things into account yet. Um, so uh, on that side, uh, on the left hand side, that's where all our carbon store is at the moment in terms of living things. Um, and then in the middle, You've got what they call the uh, inorganic carbon stock, and that's things like shell material. It's things like merle, stuff where uh, it can actually sit inside sediment sometimes for hundreds of years. So, for example, we still get lots of oyster shells washing around, even though uh, we haven't had oyster beds around here for, for a couple of hundred years. Um, but more importantly, I think from our point of view, on the right hand side there, there's the, the carbon accumulation, the sequestration. So that is where carbon is being locked away at the moment. And that's obviously where we're really interested um, because the, uh, particularly the climate change and things like that, the important thing is getting carbon out of our atmosphere and locking it away to try and mitigate some of the um, effects that are, are happening around us at the moment. And that's important for us. Now, I'm not going to give you any actual figures tonight, uh, today, rather, uh, uh, because this is uh, still rather um, experimental and we want to, to make sure it's correct. But what I can sort of say on the sequestration front, based on the figures we've got already, um, the uh, amount of uh, carbon that's locked away in our seabed annually um, is more than enough to cover the emissions that Jersey makes on an annual basis, which is quite interesting. Uh, we more than cover it considerably. Um, and uh, that map there tells you the important areas. Those are the habitats, those are the areas that are locking away uh, carbon um, and the ones that we need to be careful of because obviously if we disrupt them or we reduce biodiversity or their ability to um, produce uh, um, carbon uh, and, and lock it away, then obviously that's going to, to be to our detriment. So uh, on to the last slide. Um, Really, I suppose this is a what next thing. Um, it's an experimental model, but we think it could be extremely useful. Uh, you can ask it questions. We were trying to find out where bream nesting areas were earlier in the year. Um, and by knowing what bream like or the areas that like to nest, we were able to, to work that out with a reasonable, think with a reasonable degree of accuracy. We can do things like key habitats, but also if we wanted to build a wind farm or do cabling projects, whatever it happens to be, as an initial thing, um, you can say, well, should we build it here? And then you, really based on this model with the evidence that you've got, you have to be able to say, well, no, that's totally inappropriate or yeah, that's something you can consider. Um, as a, a sort of longer term thing, we hope that it, this sort of thing will be, uh, be able to be used on sort of wider scale planning and management and particularly decision making. Um, and that it will be uh, form a major feature within the sort of marine spatial plan that is uh, for Jersey. Right, um, I think that's my last slide. And 